It's your blood in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your blood in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only God. To you only. You give life. I love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your blood Brothers and sisters, it's just so good to see everybody, so good to be together today on this Sunday, gathering together, um, obviously in this format, but just really thrilled that we can spend some time together and just slow the rhythm of our lives down. I really believe that this is what it means to be the church, is to slow on these days together and enjoy God's presence together. And again, I know we're distance, but enjoy our presence together in community. This is what it means to be the church. And um, I'm really excited about what God wants to do within us today, this morning. If you're new and joining us, welcome. We're just so glad you've logged on and are joining us. Every week we take time to read the Psalms together. And I think this is kind of getting old, but one thing I continue to say over and over is that we need this. For many of us, a lot of people say COVID has slowed things down, but for a lot of us, um, we're busy. Life is hectic, Uh, we're going from thing to thing, and we need these moments where we center ourselves. And maybe for some of us, uh, this week has been a week where we haven't engaged the scriptures. We have this songbook, ancient songbook, that helps us just pray. And so I'm going to invite you today to join in with me, and we're going to read Psalm 22 together. And my prayer is, wherever you're reading it from, you would just read this with faith. Open your lives to God. Um, this morning as we say this. Let's say it together. You ready? Let's say it. It's on the screen. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. 
Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who, who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and let's say it, and he rules over the nations. Amen. Amen. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. Well, today, uh, th this month, uh, February, is Black History Month, as many of you know. And I thought we'd take a moment just as part of our gathering today. And I'd just like to read something. This is by a guy named Sky Jathani. Uh, I actually subscribed to his daily reflections. And he did, I think, a beautiful reflection this week that I would just like to read over our church. And so I just ask that you open your ears and your heart this morning as I read this. In January 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. was leading the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, which had started two months earlier when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger. Within days of taking the role, King started receiving hate mail, obscene phone calls, and threats to his family. Almost every day, he said, someone warned me that he had overheard white man making plans to get rid of me. Then came a phone call in the middle of the night on January 27th, 1956. The voice said, if you ain't out of this town in three days, we gonna blow your brains out and blow up your house. Unable to sleep, King poured himself a cup of coffee at his kitchen table in a, late sermon, a later sermon, he admitted being scared to death and burdened by the paralyzing effect of fear. Over his cup of coffee, he contemplated how he might leave Montgomery without appearing like a coward. He said this, I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. He confessed his fear to God and he prayed in the darkness of his kitchen. That was when he heard a second voice, not not over the phone, but an inner voice this time, and it said, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. The voice promised him never to leave me or to leave me alone. No, never alone, King says, never alone. The, the voice promised to never leave me, never to leave me alone. This was from a sermon that King later preached 11 years later on August 27th, 1967. King knew the voice belonged to Jesus, and at that moment, his fear disappeared. Although raised in a very religious home, uh, theologically educated and trained as a minister, that night in his kitchen, King experienced God in a profoundly personal and intimate way. For the first time, he felt the reality of God with him. King said that the voice convinced him that I can stand up without fear and I can face anything. His newfound courage in God's unceasing presence would be tested four, just four nights later. King's wife and two-month-old daughter were home while he conducted a rally for the boycott at the First Baptist Church. And as he finished speaking, a church member entered and told King, Your house has been bombed. When he arrived at the parsonage, he found it on fire with the front of the home destroyed. Hundreds of angry black citizens were surrounding the house with more coming from every direction. The white police officers tried to keep order, but the mob was armed with knives, bats, bottles, and guns. King found his wife and daughter unarmed, un, sorry, unharmed and then pushed his way through the crowd to the smoldering porch. King signaled to the crowd to calm down. He reminded those who had come to do battle that he who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. And then, to the amazement of both the angry black citizens and the frightened white police officers, King calmly told the mob, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to be good to them, love them, and let them know you love them. 
What we are doing is right, he said. What we are doing is just, and God is with us. One witness said, There were tears on many faces in the crowd. The weapons were put down and the crowd began singing Amazing Grace. King's wife actually later recounted that this could well have been the darkest night in Montgomery's history, but the Spirit of God was in our hearts. The sight of Reverend King standing on the rubble of his firebombed home, calling the black citizens of Montgomery to love those responsible, uh, responsible changed the course of the civil rights movement. He had preached about love, about forgiveness, about nonviolence before, said one historian. But now, but now, seeing the idea in action, millions were touched, even converted to Jesus. The real conversion did not happen on King's bombed out porch, but four nights earlier in that tranquil kitchen, Sky Jathani says. He says there, over a cup of coffee, King's fear was replaced by faith in the one who promised to always be with him. Let me pray for us. Father, as we think, as we reflect, as we hear these words, God, I just pray that, God, you would change us, change our hearts towards one another. God, I pray as a church that we would just embody your love we would own and learn from this history but god i pray as well that we would be conduits of love that we would hear these words and we would love brother and sister heart soul mind and strength continue to remind us god god draw us into repentance for the things that we've done wrong for the injustices even in our own lives we come to you, God, as a community repenting and laying our lives down. And Holy Spirit, may you take us forward. Thank you that you came into our story and gave of yourself. And may God, we open our lives to others. May we learn from this. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, again, it's so great to have you guys here. It's uh, so good to be together. Um, why don't we try to do this? Turn on our uh, cameras for a quick two seconds. Say hi. Give a what's up to everybody around. And uh, take a second. Say hello. Hello, hello. And yeah, so good to see you guys. Oh, the Praxis mug. I love it. I love it. The Praxis mug. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to actually throw it over right now to Marco Rodriguez somewhere out there in Cyber World. And Mark's just gonna, Mark has a few announcements for us. He's just going to share a few announcements with us. Good morning! This coming Saturday, March 6th, we are serving a meal at Arcade Mission. Arcade has been doing a great work feeding those on the margins in our city and they have been uh, serving close to 180 meals each day. We're going to be preparing and serving a meal for this evening from 3.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, and we need 8 to 12 people to join in. Are you interested? If so, email us at hello at mypractice.church. On Sunday, March 14th, we're gonna be celebrating 10 years since the launch of City View. On this morning, we are gonna be taking some time to look back and celebrate on what God has done and look forward to the future of our community. Following our gathering, we're gonna be having our annual meeting for anyone that is a member at Praxis. If you'd like to be a member, we would love to have you join in. All the details can be found at mypraxis.church membership. We've been having a great time going through the marriage course. We also had Laura and Mike Fess come and share with us on our, uh, at our first marriage course connect night. To conclude the marriage course, we are having another connect night on Tuesday, March 16th at 8 p.m. We have cooking with Kev. Our very own Kevin Carino is gonna be uh, taking us through a cooking demonstration. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We will be cooking alongside Kev. If you've been taking the marriage course, you will receive this week an item list that you need to get to cook the appetizers Kev will be showing us, as well as a wine list that goes great with the food we will be making. Awesome. I am like really looking forward to that. Cooking with Kev, who would have thought this is gonna be fantastic. So thanks Mark for bringing us up to speed. Lots of exciting things over the next few weeks. And then we're gonna jump into the season of Easter. So uh, buckle up. We're pretty excited about the next uh, a few months here uh, together. That's good, so good. Well, what we're gonna do today is we're actually gonna take a little bit of a pause on our teaching series through the Song of Songs, which has been fantastic, by the way. We've had some really, just really great feedback 
uh, from people. Um, we're going to take a, a bit of a pause on that. And I'd also like to say, you know, it's been great to be able to bounce ideas as we walk through this book back and forth uh, from a guy named Mike Erie, who's also been helping uh, through that teaching. So if you've missed any of the teachings through Song of Songs, we've talked about all sorts of, th all sorts of things character and wisdom, uh, what it means to be human and image bearers. These are all really important themes throughout the, throughout the book. And so we've been unpacking that and we'll get back into that next week. But if you've missed anything, uh, make sure you take a couple minutes and just go back and listen. Mike did a great job last week and it's been really, from even my own life, just really rewarding. But as we said at the beginning of the year, our winter practice right now is the practice of simplicity. One of the things that's at the heart of Jesus followers is a simple life. And one of the things we've wanted to do is cultivate a little bit uh, throughout this season and, and share in some teachings just how we're going to live simply and encourage you guys and how we're actually going to live this practice out as a community. We really, my heart is that we would just really embed in our lives a uh, simple life. I really do believe this is what it means to follow Jesus. And so, like we said, we're taking some time just to, you know, every once in a while over the next few months, just kind of break up our teachings in Song of Songs and just share what we feel like God is leading us in around this idea. And so it's really been broken down into three parts. At the beginning of the year, we talked about our time, how all of us have the same amount of, the, amount of time. And as Jesus followers, one of the things we need to continually do is do an audit and an assessment of our time and what we're putting our time and energy into. And so we really encourage everybody to think through this, to be intentional with this. Now, over the next couple months, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our money, oh yeah, and our stuff. And so today we're going to take a couple minutes and just talk about our money. Now, before we jump into the text for today, and you can open up your Bibles if you want, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you want to flip there with me. But before we get there, I've just had this nagging feeling over the last few days as I've been preparing this teaching, just to start by talking about the church just for a couple of seconds. And this was really unrelated until the last couple of days. And I felt like there's just a couple of things that need to be said. You know, I had a friend uh, visit uh, our in-person, our one and only in-person gathering in December, back in December. He came to our, our gathering and he was there. And afterwards he said to me, man, I just, I went to a church that didn't take an offering. And he was just kind of like, I think he said it in a good way. He was like, this is, this is kind of interesting. You know, most places I go, they appeal for my money. And we just got kind of chuckling about that and kind of talking a little bit about the fact that, you know, one of the things when we started this community is I didn't want to talk a lot about money as much as I wanted to teach about it. And what I mean by that is I didn't want to create a community that was always appealing for money and calling for money and talking about money every week. What I wanted to do and what we wanted to do was create a culture that would actually teach about it when the time came. And so I was big on no never ending campaigns or appeals, no coffee house or bake sale fundraisers, none of that. What we wanted to do was simply invite people into the way of Jesus and invite people into a life of generosity. And so you notice, we'll often go here, we'll go like weeks without talking about money at all. And even go weeks without telling people where they can give. And to be honest, I've wrestled through this, but part of that has kind of been intentional. One of the things that you know, if you've been a part of the story here, is we actually, and some of you that are newer know this, we actually make you inquire a little bit. We put the ball in your court with no, not a lot of appeals or coming at you. We actually make new people inquire about how to contribute to this community. And I actually think that that's something healthy. And this is usually how it goes. People begin as they kind of enter into the community and start to participate. They begin to ask, okay, like how can I contribute? And that's been really intentional, not coming over and over to our community. One of the things we've wanted to do is create a community from the very beginning that lives within our means. Shocker, I know, right? Who, who would have thought in a world of debt and reaching for the stars? We just wanted to be from the very beginning, this simple community that lives within our means. And ultimately, one of the things we wanted to do is run with the resources that we have. 
not get ahead of ourselves. Sometimes church communities can fall into this prey of having such a big vision and needing money for that vision that they actually fall behind. And so even when we launched Praxis a couple years ago, I, we wanted to live simply. Even I was committed at the turn when we moved into being an autonomous kind of independent church on our own, out from under the wings of our mother church, I, I, I thought we're gonna do this no matter what. Even if I have to get another job, I'll do it. And don't get me wrong, this, this job, leading this community is a full-time job. But we just wanted to create a community that wasn't always appealing, wasn't living, uh, begging. We wanted to live simply and we wanted to live this out wisely. I have a friend who's um, uh, actually head of church planting for all of Canada and for our network of churches. And he's such a great guy. And he's from Edmonton and he was helping a couple years ago load in for their church because he's a part of a church plant and they were loading in their stuff and he was helping. And he turned to somebody and just jokingly, he had the purest heart when he said it. He said to somebody, man, this is a lot of work for four songs. And all of our host team and anybody on our band and people that set up our kids leaders, you know, it's quite a bit of work. And he wasn't saying it facetiously. He was kind of just saying it lightheartedly. Like this is a lot of work for four songs. And I often think when it comes to church and money, it's a lot sometimes the way the Western church has set itself up is it is a lot of money for four songs. And obviously church is more than four songs. But we've just been compelled and drawn into this vision to live simple and in a deeper way of discipleship to Jesus. And I just felt like this week as we talk about this, uh, let you, just to let you know, we actually, because of this, are the head now with our resources as a community and not the tail. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I am I'm super proud of our community. Is there room to grow? Absolutely. There's tons of room to grow. But... I think this church has been a model and all of you guys just jumping in with your time, your attention and your finances in this, in this community. It's beautiful. And now we're the head and not the tail, you know, throughout my life in the church, I've often heard churches, you know, want to implement things in church life that help people with their money. I even know of churches that ask people to live simply or they'll push people to do things like Financial Peace University, which we've actually done as a church community and it's fantastic. But I know of churches that will push their people and invite their people to do those things, yet don't model those same principles within their church community. And I'm just, you know, go, go do Financial Peace, but let, as a church, we have like millions and millions of dollars of debt, right? There's something, there's something off with that. So I just hope you hear my heart. That at the very core of it, we have endeavored to be responsible, to live simply, to model this. Are we perfect? We're not perfect, no. But from the very beginning, I know that I can't sit up here and ask us as a community to live simply and within our means, with our money as Jesus followers, without leading the way as a, as, as a church leadership and as a church in how we set things up. And I just want to say, I've just been feeling all week as I've been engaging the scripture, how proud I am of all of us and all of you in the best sense, proud in the best sense. And here's the thing, when we talk about money, I'm actually, I have actually grown personally in a confidence in talking about this. I really have. This is, this actually this morning is a joy to me. I would say 10 years ago, maybe wasn't so much a joy to talk about money. But again, because of the way we've set things up, I, I feel a sense of joy in this. Like if I was honest with you, anytime I talk about things like prayer or, or things like Sabbath, uh, honestly, my insufficiencies and my inadequacies in these areas, honestly, sometimes I don't sleep before I, I teach on those things because I know deep within me when I talk about prayer and encourage our community around fixed hour prayer and, you know, that rhythm that we've been trying to build and uh, praying the Lord's Prayer every day. I know that when I communicate that with our community, at the same time, there's deep flaws in my own life around some of these areas. So it's hard um, to get up sometimes and teach about these things, knowing that there needs to be a deeper work within my own life. But with this and talking about money, I actually, I'm, I get really excited because again, there's been a level of simplicity over the years and my life personally has been I would say revolutionized by the way of Jesus and how we can grow in this. And even in our own family, you know, you talk about prayer or Sabbath and some of those inadequacies. I really feel like this has been something that's been practiced in our own context that I come to this, you know, the, the, the ideas that Jesus shares about money and I get jacked up because I don't want your money. And 
we don't want your money. That's that's not the heart of this at all. We don't we don't want or need your money. We want this to be an invitation way greater than just hey, you need to give to a church, which is often the way churches position themselves with money. Way deeper than that. I want us to live life in the kingdom of God in the here and now. And living simply and living well with our money is a massive part of that. You with me? Nod your head somewhere with me, okay? With that said, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is right in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' manifesto for kingdom living. And Jesus talks about all sorts of things within uh, this, this sermon that's collected, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And of course, he drills down. So here's the thing. We are going right to the source. This is going right to the source of it all. Jesus' very own words about money. Ready? This is what it says. Matthew 6, verse 19. It says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, context here, in the first century, there were no banks, no safety deposit boxes. Ultimately, if you had wealth and accumulated treasure, what you would do is you would take it. Oftentimes, in the first century, a lot of people would dig a hole in the ground, and a way to to keep it sometimes was to bury it in a field or hide it in a cave. And, you know, the valuables in that day were coins and articles of clothing. An average man or woman would have basically one pair of clothes, And so there was this idea when Jesus shares about this, when you bury your treasure, it is susceptible to moth and to rust and to decay. And the problem is, is obviously you think you're well off and then you go and you go to dig up or kind of draw out your treasure and there it is all nasty in the ground. And so this picture is like, right in front of the people listening on. They understand what's going on. The problem here, though, when Jesus says not to store our treasure up in earth, but in heaven, is that we have to talk first about our concept of heaven and really linguistically what this means. How we think about heaven is very interesting in the West because when we think of heaven, we often think of a place you go where you, a place you go when you die. The problem with that is, is a lot of people look at Jesus teaching about money here and they think about storing their treasure up in heaven as storing it up in some far, far land far away, like in another world or in another life. And that's actually not what Jesus is saying here. When Jesus says to store up your treasure in heaven, he's talking about right here and right now. Um, The problem is, is in the first century, and if you know this, and I've said this before, The writer Matthew, this gospel, we have four different gospels and there's different writers with different backgrounds. Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. Because of that, the, the Jewish, the pious Jewish community would never write the name of God. And so what you'll notice when you read, even in English, when you read the gospel of Matthew, is Matthew always interchanged the, the name of God or the concept of God for heaven. So the kingdom of God in Matthew was called the kingdom of heaven. And he did this again because this was written to a very pious community. You got to think of it in terms like that. Like that, When Matthew is writing here, Jesus' words that we're to store our treasure up in heaven, ultimately what he's saying is not some far off place way out there in another world or in another time. What Jesus is ultimately saying is we are to store our treasure up in God now. Basically what he's saying is you have two options. Jesus is saying this to the crowd and he would say it to us here and now. You can lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. You can obviously put your treasure and everything that you have monetary wise into earth or you can lay up for yourselves treasure in God. And you and I can actually do that now. We don't have to wait for some other world but we can actually do that in the here and now. Then he goes on, look down, verse 22, he says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So what Jesus does here is he talks about where we're storing up our treasure. And then he moves towards this concept concept of our entire lives. 
You know, for us, when we hear the word eye, we think of obviously our eyeballs. But the eye in Hebrew uh, was a Hebrew euphemism for how you handled money. In Jesus' world, if you had money and you were generous with your money, you had a healthy or you had a good eye. But if you had lots of money and you were greedy and stingy with people, the common phrase or the euphemism is that you had an unhealthy or evil eye. If your eye is healthy, Jesus says your whole body is healthy. The way you view and understand, and Jesus is ultimately saying, the way you steward your treasure is not just one component of your life. Jesus is very clear throughout the scriptures and so are the New Testament writers that this is a whole life type of thing. When you're generous monetarily with your money, it flows into your entire life. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be healthy. And most of us know this, that if we can get a handle on our finances in a world that approaches money so differently, it affects our entire lives. There's two different ways of living. Jesus is putting it here. There's generosity or there is greed. He goes on, verse 24, hang with me. He says this, no one can serve two masters. For either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then Jesus' infamous words, most of us know it here, you cannot serve God and money. What's interesting here, the word serve, the English word can actually, it's probably better translated worship. That's the layered context to it for us. Jesus is like, you can't worship God and money. And not only does it, it use this word money, but actually the, the Greek word here that is used is the word mammon. And this, I mean, this is weighty. Maybe not for us when we hear the word money here, but if you were to read mammon here, you, you would know as a Hebrew reader especially that to this community, to the Jewish community, that more than money, mammon was actually the spiritual force at the back end of the craving for things. Mammon was actually this God. Actually, this is the only time in all of Jesus' teachings where Jesus actually names a rival God. And he uses it right here, mammon, which is translated money in our, in our Bibles. But think about it. Think about the weight of this. Jesus says, you can't serve both these things. You cannot serve me and follow me in my way. And you can't serve mammon, this God, this God of material. It's crazy. So he actually puts name, Jesus does, to a rival God. So what do we learn here? We learn all sorts of things. I know we, we rush, kind of rush through that, that, that passage. There's all sorts of things going on here. But there's, I think, two important things that Jesus continues to drill down on when he talks about money. One is that our hearts always go where we put our money. This is big for Jesus. Sometimes we want to compartmentalize. We want to tear those things apart. We want to talk about our hearts and our affections and our lives. And we want to talk about money. To Jesus, that's not how it was. Our heart always goes where we put our money. If you open up my bank statement, which is actually a daunting thing when I think about it. Well, first of all, Heather does all her banking. I haven't checked our bank account for 12 years or whatever. However, I guess we've been married 13 years. She does all that, which is amazing. But you know, it is a daunting thing to, to think that I can talk about my spiritual life. I can talk about following Jesus. I can talk about being a great pastor. But really what reveals my life is if you were to right now open up my easy web or whatever it's called and put it out there, that would reveal where my heart is. And then Jesus continually talks that everything that we have belongs to God and should be stewarded, stewarded and, and through our lives for him. Everything we have is God's. You know, sometimes Christians, because of the Old Testament law, want to get into percentages and should I give this amount and that amount? Listen, you're not under law to tithe like the Old Testament Hebrew people. I always say, though, it makes a whole lot of sense, the the whole idea of tithing. We really don't have time for this. It it does make sense in the sense of the equal responsibility and amongst the community. It just makes sense in how Israel lived. But ultimately as well, many people don't know, that community had a lot of different things that they give to, gave to were up to 23% of their, 24% of their income was actually given to the working of the economy and to the community itself. 
I don't think we need to get into percentages as much as understanding that everything we have is God's. And by the way, it, the studies just showed, I think Barna just did a study, like most Christians and followers of Jesus only give 2% of their income away anyway. So why talk about percentages? And that's not a guilt thing. That's just the reality that the poor Hebrew community gave well over 20% back in the day. We want to kind of quib over how much. Everything we have is God's. And this is Jesus' vision for the world. And simplicity plays into this. This call to be simple so that there's this opening of our lives. Jesus said even here earlier in Matthew chapter 6 that when you give, there was actually this idea that this was like, this is something that Jesus' followers do. Now, we've been talking a lot about sex recently. And, you know, one of the common things that people say about the Bible's view of sex is that it has a really exclusive and narrow and restricted view of sexuality. This is the common thing that I think people, both in the church and outside the church right now, they look at it, you know, the Bible's ideas of sex and who we actually give our bodies to is repressive. And, you know, you hear these things, these different terms kind of being put on sex and sexuality from a biblical kind of view. And I always find it funny when people kind of critique that. They say, man, the Bible's view of sexuality and all this is, is intolerant. I can't believe it would say something like this. But then I get thinking, do you know what the Bible says about money? It's so funny because right now we're just super hyper interested in sex culturally and within the church that we obsess over this. So th th these are the underlying questions. Who can sleep with who? Who can do what with who? And again, sometimes people, their posture towards the restrictions and that they don't like it. But then I get thinking about other issues in the New Testament and how restrictive and kind of what we're called into and how we live these other things out. And money is, is no different. You know, more than anything else, more than anything else outside the kingdom of God, Jesus talked the most about money. Some of that was in his parables and kind of giving a kingdom vision. But Jesus and the scriptures talk about money a lot. And in many ways, we're not just restricted with what we do with our bodies as the Jesus community and being drawn into a particular way of life and a sexual ethic in that sense. We're, we're called to all sorts of restrictions in all sorts of areas of our lives. Money actually being one of them. That what Jesus has to say when we enter the way of Jesus, I just, I continue to tell people, it's just hard all over the place, continually being probed and challenged in how we live this out. And there's actually judgment around this. We'll close with this. Um, the book of Revelation opens with uh, some letters to seven different churches in the ancient Medi Mediterranean at the time. And it's a vision from Jesus. And Jesus is basically doing some things. One, he's calling them to himself. And in some ways, Jesus, for some of the churches, most of the churches, he's actually rebuking them. There's rebukes. There's correction that Jesus gives through this kind of prophetic writing for the church to come back to God and to live in the way of Jesus. And so with the letters written to these seven churches uh, early on in Revelation, God through Jesus, and then through John, who's got this revelation of Jesus, is calling the people back to God's vision for the world. Calling them to put their hand to the kingdom and that the kingdom of God is coming. So you have different communities in different cities, and there's actually this letter written, this little thing that you'll see in Revelation 3, written to the Laodicean church uh, in the ancient Mediterranean. And I've just was reading this, and is, I'm fascinated with what Jesus actually says to them. You know, the Laodicean church had tons of economic power. It was unparalleled to any other church that actually Jesus speaks to in Revelation. They were wealthy, they were rich, and here's the thing, they knew it. They knew, they knew the resources they had in comparison to the other cities around them. And there's some reasons for that, as with you know, modern day cities. Sometimes certain cities are more prosperous than others because of tech and different industry. They, they knew it. And Jesus has something to say to them, and it's not easy to hear, but I think it's important for us to listen to. Jesus says this, Revelation 3, you may have it in front of you if you don't just listen. Says this, the angel of the church to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, and this is what Jesus says. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. This is what he says. I know your deeds, Jesus says, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. 
So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm, this is what Jesus says of the church. He says, you say, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are actually wicked and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus only had really hard things to say about sexuality, right? Are you kidding me? Do you read this? Jesus confronts this community here about their lukewarmness. Now, if you went to youth camp like I did, you'd often probably hear sermons like, you need to to be either hot or you just need to be cold for the kingdom of God, right? You need to be, you mean you need to be white hot for Jesus. And if you're Jesus would rather have you cold than kind of be somewhere in the mushy middle. All these things that we say over time. This is actually not what Jesus is saying to this church. There's actually context here. One is around wealth and money. It's so interesting how we say, you need to be hot spiritually or just get out and be cold, right? That's not what this is dealing with. The city of Laodicea was actually situated between two water sources. Many of you have heard this before. One was a natural hot spring and one was a natural cold water source. And this actually built into the economy of the city. And there were actually pipelines that went from the city to these two different water sources. The hot springs had minerals in them that had medicinal properties. And it would be helpful and curative in that culture to have these hot springs. It was like basically like a hot tub with essential oils. Where are my, all, all my essential oils people at? That's basically what it was. Right just outside the city. Then you had this fresh water that would also come in that would refresh in. And here's what Jesus is saying. I would rather that you be like the hot springs, that you would be people that would bring healing and soothing, right? This is what the hot springs did. Or I would rather have you be like the cold, refreshing water that brings life. But when that water got to the city, oftentimes through the system, it was lukewarm. And so the people in Laodicea, they knew as an image for them that this lukewarmness, they knew what it was like. They knew what it was like to have the refreshing. They knew what it was like to have the hot springs, but they also understood what lukewarm meant. And they knew what Jesus was saying. If they were neither cold nor hot, they are just like the culture around them in Laodicea. And one of the questions we have to ask is, what's this about? Well, it's about their wealth. The people in Laodicea had great wealth. And Jesus is saying here, if you are lukewarm like this, you are just, you are living just like the culture around them, which had a lot of wealth and economic power that was often abused. And so Jesus says, I, you, you think of yourselves, you think you're rich, you've acquired wealth and do not need a thing but you do not realize that you're actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You can have all the money in the world, but how you steward this is so important and how you live this out. You can have everything at your disposal, but if you do not live in my way, you're actually actually wretched and pitiful. Welcome to church, right? This is a reminder to us that in the Western world, just to remind you, you're, you're rich. Even if you feel like you don't have a lot, we are rich. Most of us are in, even at a middle class kind of income, are in the top 1% in the world. With Bill Gates, Elon Musk, you put them in there, right? Now they're at the top of the top 1%, but most of us are in that 1%. And it's so easy for the church in the West to just think we hold power over over cultures and over other people because of our wealth. And even more so, think that we're okay just because we have resources, whether in the church or in our lives. And I want to caution us from that. If Jesus was here and he was writing us a letter, I think there would be very similar things written to us. And guys, honestly, it's not, it's not always easy to hear. These are, these are difficult teachings. Money is an incredibly important part of our spirituality and how we walk our discipleship out. And I just want us to be warned. I want us to hear this. Listen, there are times and moments when we come to the scripture and it's encouraging and it lifts us up. But I also think we need to to press into those weighty things that we find in the scripture and understand that this is calling our lives in how we live this out, both as a church and as individuals. So here's what I want to leave you you with. A few, just a few practical thoughts for us 
in simplicity and how we use our money. One is the encouragement is to live simply so that you can live generously. The ultimate goal of this is that you would find a way in your life to, and we would find, continue to find ways as a community where we live simply so that we can be generous. You know, as a church, we've done that. W one out of every $10, and we'll bring you up to speed on this on our little 10-year uh, anniversary and bring you up to speed with some of the things going on at our annual meeting, but one out of every $10 basically last year went out to global and local missions, to things right here in our community. Our thought is, as a community, if we can live simply as a people, that just opens up doors over and over to be generous. And ultimately, in a time and space where a lot of churches were hurting because of COVID and different things, we were able to do some things that we, I never thought we'd able to do. And I think about our individual lives. You need to get a plan in place. And we need to get plans in place in how we can live simply as people so that we can be generous, open-handed, and living the way Jesus has called us. The best way to fight the God of mammon is to continually to get a plan in place in our lives to, to, to live generously. And so that may be for you today, sitting down and thinking about how you can live this out and being generous. I am not talking about the church, okay? We are, like, this is not an appeal for the church. This is an appeal for all of us to think about how simply we can live in the Jesus way, to be generous. Second thing is this. I want to encourage all of us to prioritize giving to the poor and the marginalized. This is actually a non-negotiable and for all the type of church, you know, in the West we want to put on and amazing church services and all that, the call is actually a, an open posture to the poor. That's what the scriptures, the New Testament calls them, calls this community and the more marginalized in our city. And you need to think of creative ways in which, and I need to think of creative ways in which we can exercise this with our, our stuff. We all have, the, the, the difference between time is we all have the same amount of time, but we all have different uh, obviously amounts of money de depending on the season of life you're in the decisions you've made as far as vocation and work and life some of us are just starting out some of us are older we're in different places and spaces in that but we need to think through how we are postured to the poor and marginalized this is how I want we want praxis to live and I think slowly we're getting there you know this has been for our own family something we've had to think through the last decade or more no matter how things are going in our lives even how things are going in the church we must be postured towards a place um, where we can be generous to th those around us. And there's, there's part of me, honestly, and I, I'm not complaining here. It sounds like maybe I'm complaining, but I'm kind of tired of the social justice talk. I love that talk, by the way, without monetary value behind it. There's so much talk in the church right now about social justice. And if you know, Heather and I, we're right there. But oftentimes I want to ask, okay, what kind of uh, equity and shared resources going into this because it's actually it's a huge part huge piece of the puzzle in living this out you with me so I just want us all to think think about your life think about you being connected to this church certainly but how can we be postured to the marginalized what can be different things that you can give to and be open to on a week to week and a month to month basis don't yeah, honestly the call is give beyond what we're doing here there's so much that you need to get a vision for in our world come alongside God. And then I'll just say this, the third thing I've just been thinking about all week is just a challenge for us to grow in the grace of giving. Guys, let this be something that we can grow in. Get a plan together. You know, there's people, I know, great friends that have made commitments that they will, as their income grows, you know, they're younger and maybe they're business people or whatever, they're, as their income grows, that they would live at the same level or standard of living and give the rest away. What a beautiful vision. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I know of people that have made this commitment to grow in giving, certainly to provide for their, their needs and to, to be wise in how they spend their money, but also as time goes, thinking about all the extra. You know, For some people, you're in a, a place right now where with your job, your business, whatever, there's gonna be greater income that will come to you over the next decade or two decades. I would encourage all of us that we would just grow in the grace of giving. Like that church we talked about in the first week of 2001 with Mark Hazard, he was here, that they just, they were poor, they didn't have a lot, but they, they grew in this grace. They were continually uh, thinking about how they could be generous to those around them. This is not about a church, this is not about pumping up our budgets. I hope you hear me loud and clear. 
My hope for us as disciples is that we would live this out. And just a reminder, you need a plan. You just need a plan. You need to think through with time, money, and we're going to talk on our next Simplicity teaching. We're going to talk about being simple with our stuff, our wardrobe, different things in our lives that we need to be simple in. All of it takes a plan. We can have this teaching right here, pray in a, in a minute and go home and go, wow, that, that sounded really nice. Like, yes, let's be generous. All of us need to get a plan in place. That means sitting down. I grew up in a very, and we're still part of a charismatic tradition, which is great. And it's always kind of been like, let's be led by the spirit, which I'm all for. But honestly, we need to actually put a plan that can be practiced in place. And I encourage you to do that, to live simply, to give generously, to pri prioritize those who are marginalized, think through that with your life, and ultimately just get a vision for your life and how you can come alongside God and grow in this grace of giving. I, I honestly come to this, it's crazy. 10 years ago, it would not have been like this. I'd be sweating under my arms talking about money. Now, it, it just brings me so much joy because I think what we've been able to do as a community and how I've seen this lived out, God has given us, he's blessed us, and now to think we can be open conduits to the world is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And just a reminder, a lot of people talk about giving and getting. You know, you sow, so you reap. And there's there's some principles of that in, in the scriptures. But I often say when it comes to giving and getting, it's not what you think. I think about our own life and our own family. And you know what Bring, being generous has actually got us? For our family, being generous, the thing that we've reaped from that is not loving money. The greatest thing, we talk a lot of times, you hear people on TV or whatever, if you give, you're going to get, you're, you know, you sow in, God's going to get you back however many fold. Fine. Sure. I don't know. I don't know where actually where I stand with that, right? Um, all I know with my own life in generosity is one of the things that has marked our lives and it's been so beautiful is we just don't love money. We don't love money like the culture does. We don't worship mammon. And that could potentially be the very point in life with God. So this is just an invitation into simplicity. You need, we need to think of ways in which we can live this out simply. And my hope and our prayer as a community is that we would be simple with our time. We'd be strategic with our time, but money would be a great indicator of how we're living in the way of Jesus. You with me? You with me? You know what? I'm not even going to pray here. I'm actually, we're going to bust into groups. Cam's going to send us into some groups. Guys, we love you so much. You'll notice in the uh, wheel there, in the chat wheel, that there's announcements if you uh, want to join in with some of the things coming up. But I, I'm going to have some of our leaders just pray over you. And maybe you want to wrestle through this. But um, let's live simply so that we can be generous people. Grace and peace. We love you. We'll see you next week. We'll be back in Song of Songs next week. Cam, send us away. Thanks, brother.